Yoshi Shimatsu is in Japan right now, back in the middle of the uh, terribly contaminated parts of, of Japan, and he has a report for us. Are you there, Yoshi? Yeah, I hope we can hold the line. Um, yeah, we're. I think you were unable to get through earlier. Yeah, so, we got you now. Uh, though. I'm anyway. sorry, we, we we're uh, running late yeah, on all so, accounts here. It's kind of chaotic. Yeah, but yeah. We we got okay, you. Uh, yeah, so. We got you there, and I was just telling people that you were yeah. telling me in an email that people are beaten down, uh, like heavy smokers well, resigned to someday getting cancer. I mean, it's. I don't know. It, it seems like the realization of what's being done to them came swept yeah. through them and left them in a state of completely depleted spirituality. It's weird. Well, this is, you know, strange because I'm finding out that in the cities that's the case, but as soon as I get out to the countryside near the nuclear areas and tsunami area, people are not so depressed, whoever's left here. Uh, a lot of it's been depopulated here. We were just going through some uh, uh, through some um, areas by um, near the uh, Onagawa nuclear plant in uh, near Sendai, off Sendai, where... You know, whole neighborhoods are just wiped out. And there's still buildings standing, which there's nobody there. You know, they're smashed. And uh, I, I was a bit confused for a while because we, uh, you know, the train line is cut in many places. In fact, I'm on a bus right now. I was supposed to be. I was just cut off of a train, and where there are these vast fields of uh, weeds. You know, tall weeds. Mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out what they were. If they were rice fields on. Later on, I I found the taxi driver who told me, no, that's where houses used to stand. I mean, these are just vast areas, neighborhoods just completely wiped off the map, and there's just weeds there now. But it seems uh, the people who are around here in the devastated zone are in better spirits because, uh, you know, not too many people are visiting. They're happy to see somebody. We uh, just ran into some fishermen uh, here who were quite pleased that someone came to their village. I mean, these are pretty isolated places, and these guys are living right next to a nuclear power station. And uh, they have nothing to do. They have boats. Their boats survive, but uh, they, how they, far are uh, they from catch. how far are they from the exclusion zone? Well, this this is around the other nuclear plant. This is not the Fukushima. This is the one in off Sendai where um, there's been some releases of radioactivity. In fact, there was a press conference this morning. Uh, my my press registration long run out here, so I couldn't get in. But there were a lot of journalists there, uh, Japanese journalists, mm -hmm. getting a uh, what do you call it the uh, the dog and pony show, you know, from the uh, plant. I, I had my uh, uh, Stevert, my uh, beans about four times as high as uh, you're getting in the nearest city. So there's still a lot of, obviously, water going through a cool down plant. And uh -huh. uh, it was very interesting because I got there very early in the morning, you know, because uh, transport is very, very dodgy. You know, I think I left uh, Sendai about uh, 530 in the or about 530 in the morning, you know, to get to this place. Right. Took a couple of hours to get there. Got it. And um, uh, it's very interesting because uh, we got there during the fog. And uh, while there was fog on the water, wherever there was, the readings were quite high. But as soon as the fog lifted, let's say by about uh, 10 in the morning, you know, uh, uh, several hours later, a couple hours later, uh, the radiation counts were going down. You know, so obviously it's carried in the fog. Now this is very, see, this is very important because it's what we've been saying here along California, Oregon, Washington. The waters are, are going to be picking up more and more cesium in the next yeah. few years. That means the marine layer, wave action, mm -hmm. micro-sized particulates, mm -hmm. fog, uh, mm -hmm. precipitation that falls as rain near the coast, all of it is going yeah. to potentially be transporting, uh, it'll be vectoring cesium. Yeah, exactly. It's a salt, so it'll be carried like seawater. You know, in the, by the ocean in the fog, you can smell the seawater. And that was sort of the case here by the Zonagawa plant. And I was out there because that's sort of the mystery plant where there was a long blackout on uh, uh, last year on March uh, the 12th in which uh, NHK World shut down for two minutes when they mentioned this accident. And the official record says the accident uh, today, I mean, the, the official record says the accident did not happen until the next day. And that most of the radiation by then was coming from Fukushima, which was not the case. Uh, it's clear that if you look at the geography of this place, it's north of Fukushima. There's really some tall uh, hills, mountains. It's not a peninsula, and there's some really tall mountains behind it separating it from Fukushima. So the air from Fukushima, would have, uh, the wind would have carried over this nuclear plant, far over with the updrafts of the mountain. So this, this uh, and on that day, the radiation count was 100 times above normal level. So this was more than just a little spill from a 
uh, uh, spent fuel tank. So what it was, they're still not saying. They're they're saying there was some dents in the fuel in some of the uh, spent fuel rods, but it's really still not clear what really happened because this place is very isolated compared with Fukushima. Uh, there's only a couple of fishing villages out there. Very hard to get to. There's no train or bus service out there. So it's quite a chore getting out there. Not too many people know, and I don't think the local people are very aware, too, because not a lot of the local press carries any information. So, Which is why they're cheerful out here, is that they just don't have information. You know, they're not like city people who are closer to the sources. That's, of, that's uh, uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, they're country people. It's people, it. fishermen, farmers, mm -hmm. uh, small town, you know, small town people. Some of them work. The tourism industry has been shut down since then, so they're not getting a lot of word. So they're quite cheerful. I don't think they realize, you know, the the situation. And 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 when you look at the tsunami damage, earthquake and tsunami damage, you see a whole like uh, the town of Onagawa itself, the port is 90% wiped out. You know, there's just just totally erased off the map. So after a trauma like that, you know, the survivors are hardly worried right now. To, to be very frank about, about about nuclear releases, because. You know, they just evaded something that was just like overwhelmingly massive, and uh, you know, beyond their imagination. So, so, but in the cities, people are very depressed. Uh, I think the economic situation right. being down right. in the summer, it's long hot summer, it's dragging out. They're relentlessly bombarded by all kinds of lies and deception from the government. Uh, TEPCO is going to raise the um, the utility fees. So uh, the taxes are going to rise. So people just are, are beaten to a pulp in the cities. Exactly. They're not very cheerful. Uh -huh. And Sendai was the one city is close enough in the zone, you know, Tohoku zone there, uh, that that you know people there tend to it tends to be a party town, you know, party town. So people there in the first year after the uh, in the first months after the disaster, you know, got into heavy drinking and all that. But right now it's very very quiet and. Tokyo also very 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 quiet. Also. What do you hear, Yochi, I mean, about uh, right? Yeah. What, what do you hear about suicide rates? Uh, well, this uh, uh, a guy in Tokyo, a friend of mine, just told me there's a lot of people dying in Japan now, rather inexplicably of late. He says you know the death rate is staggering, and I asked him was it a suicide or heart attacks, and he says it's not clear. No one, you know, no one's reporting. No one knows, you know. If it's suicide, it's not making, you know, uh, maybe the families don't want to reveal that. If it's uh, illness-related suicide, no one's talking, you know. So, it's uh, yeah, the death rate is up, but uh, it's very unclear because the medical community itself tends to be very, you know, privacy. I think in Asia as a whole, like uh, all across Asia, uh, medical privacy is taken much more seriously uh, and protected by the medical community than it is in the United States where it's just considered statistic or, you know, public record. Uh, information, so very hard to decipher what's going on. You know, I'll be trying to do that over the coming week, trying to figure out what is going on. And uh, the t uh, the town that I was just in, uh, near Onagawa, surrounds Onagawa. Actually, the uh, the uh, Ishinomaki. Is, there's been a lot of uh, death rate there, but when you look again, when you look at the scale of the devastation from the tsunami. It's hard to uh, you know the, the post disaster. Story sort of gets lost in this, uh, you know, tremendous swath of destruction all over the place, and it's, it's far worse off. I, I didn't come here on my last three trips. It's far worse than uh, I had expected because other areas have been, you know, totally wiped off the map. So you know, it, it, uh, it pales in comparison. But still, vast neighborhoods just wrecked and destroyed. So and the people all gone, and uh, people living in these uh, temporary quarters, you know, these little steel prefabricated structures and you know mm -hmm. so it's uh, scattered all around the countryside so right. you know again information is very very hard to collect out here because the communities are just so you know uh been so disrupted you know uh, by diaspora and by destruction and you know uh, the huge casualties so so the real you know, still remains that you know i'm surprised that this is so far long gone and it remains you know, the, the hand of the disaster is still very, very, very present, you know, in people's memories. That's what they're talking about. They're eager to talk about the, you know, the day of the tsunami and all that stuff. It, 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 so it's still rather fresh on them, and there's visible evidence everywhere to remind them of that constantly. So, And I think this is a, a problem. And then I also heard also that following the triple disaster, March 11th, that June, there was some massive uh, typhoon came in, and... Uh, 
they call it a mountain tsunami. It just, you know, you know, just millions of tons of water washing off the mountain, wrecking uh, buildings that were further higher up. So, you know, this, they were they were hit by a quadruple disaster. So, you know, quite unthinkable. You know, these things are beyond. You know, uh, I you know, what, I, what, I Yochi, before, Yochi, but, you were there before. Mm-hmm. What are the farmers doing? Yeah. That you were able to teach them to do. You brought a lot of information. Not well. A lot not of effort. Well. I, I, there, there's been decontamination going on, but there's no place to store it. They're taking off too much soil, and they're trying to remove the soil to vacant plots of land rather than try to decontaminate it on their own land, which is the only viable course is to you know, do it on your own land. You know, uh, because you just cannot physically remove the stuff and. Uh, and so that's a real national crisis. Uh, the prime the prime minister himself has talked about that. There's not there's no storage places for the soil, so they don't know what to do. They're boxed in. They're not very you know they they don't know about how to filter out you know uh, decontamination by burning the plant the plant material. And one of the reasons you the te- the, the standard method developed by Chernobyl was not soil removal. It was uh, you know growing plant uh, phyto remediation plants that would remove. The radiation, then you would burn them safely, filtering the water, filtering it through water, and then uh, storing the ashes. So you have smaller volume of storage. You'd be much more concentrated, but the volume would be a little bit more manageable. So they're not doing that, and it's a real crisis. I uh, met a woman who's with a Buddhist temple who wants to do something about this, but it's that one, one Buddhist temple did lead the way, it's then Buddhist temple, and they're storing soil on the temple land, but this is, they've reached their limit too. So this is a real problem. So remain, and then the rice crop is in, people are still growing rice and so on. So life goes on, you know, they, they feel trapped. They don't, they don't feel, you know, there's a way out. You know, I'm passing right now by some very green bird rice fields that, you know, and rice is pretty amazing because other plants like pine trees are killed by the tsunami, but the rice plants are pretty resistant to the, uh, to the salt water. So. And, they're, and they'll just absorb the salt, and they'll absorb the radiation. So, so the, the, know, the, uh, the, the talk of sunflowers and other kinds of plants to remediate the that soil. That would work, but the, there's a lot. The government itself dashed the idea because it says it would take too long. It would take up to five years. And then the government's point of view is they wanted an immediate solution to get things back to normal, and they encouraged soil removal. Now they don't have a place for it. So they actually dashed the only viable way of uh, removal, you know, that's a problem. So the government itself said, well, it takes too long, you know, and uh, and people went with the government and, and Ministry of Agriculture. So, and this ministry has been very, very bad. You know, they're the ones who sort of turned a blind eye to the sale of cattle out of uh, the radi- radioactive zone and all that. They banned the removal of cattle in the first place. Then they turned a blind eye when all these radioactive cattle went onto the market, so. You know, it's a bureaucracy. It's terrible. And uh, unfortunately, these communities in this part of the country are very isolated rural communities. In the main city, uh, you know, uh, people are more connected to the other main cities than they are to the countryside. So really, it's, uh, you know, it's this information gap is vast out here. You know, people, you know, uh, have to learn from outsiders. That's the sad truth. This is more information coming from you know the outside world has than people here inside Japan and especially inside this region here. Right, North. right. Okay. So it's, uh, it still remains a tough situation, and I thought it would move forward a little faster than it would, uh-huh, at least in terms uh-huh. of the information level. But uh, it's not reaching these people, and uh, and they they're trying to cope. Everyone's just harassed by just the daily economic problems of you know uh, finding a job, keeping a job, or you know, rebuilding a house and uh, moving uphill, you know, getting out of the lowlands and uh, so on and so forth. So people are just completely preoccupied just with uh, survival, you know. So, and unfortunately, the government is not doing the right things. You know, that's when you need a government to sort of lend a helping hand to people, show them the right way. But this, uh, obviously, that hasn't happened. They've been, you know, the government has been misdirecting, misguiding people all along. So. It's a tough role for these people to hold. And, but uh, the, the good side is there are still volunteers coming up. I stayed at a guest house, and there were still young you know, Japanese kids coming in to, uh, from the cities, from different parts of the country, to volunteer to help people tear down their houses, 
But then they were complaining they were getting no information on radiation safety, and they were very surprised when I told them that they should wear sunglasses or any kind of eye protection because, you know, I, as I mentioned last year, that radiation does burn uh, the surface of your eyes, and the least you can do is protect yourself in some of these basic ways. But you know, no one informed them, and the NGOs sort of don't want to raise alarms either among people. But, you know, uh, so basic safety concerns are not really being addressed for the volunteers, and that's something else we uh, work on in the coming Well, <laughs> as, you, as you know, the workers at Fukushima are getting sick, more and more of them, and they're running short well, on you workers. Saw that little bit, yeah, you saw that little bit of video where they supposedly removed two fuel rods, which I now have really, on second look, really have doubts about is that those right. were real rods being removed. I, I agree. I think that was a dummy operation. Because uh, you, yeah, in, in a rigging situation, because they did after the uh, backhoe picked it up, it had to be attached to a crane by a steel cable, and something long and heavy like that could swing around very, very easily and knock twenty guys, you know, knock some of the twenty guys off the roof. Usually, rigging crews are very small, three men crews, four at the most, because you don't want many people around if the metal starts swinging or cable, you know, uh, starts to. Uh, 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 get, you know, uh, over curled or, you know, a, a lot of these cables, they tighten up and they curl in the wrong way. They start, things start swinging wildly and you just got to back off, jump if you have to, to save your life. Yeah. So 20 guys on a roof like that is a training exercise with a dummy. And, uh, that was being passed off as the two rods that, uh, they removed. I have serious doubts about that. Also, they had no rigging gear. They had no gloves, uh, you know, no work gloves over their safety gloves. They, um, uh, no tools. They had no extra cables. Usually, uh, if there's something wrong with the cable, you would have a replacement there. Nobody, there was no extra cables lying around, anything like that. So obviously, that wasn't a genuine work situation. Uh, uh, it was that. It was some sort of dummy thing, and they released the video just to uh, show that they're doing something and you know that they're effectively removing something, which I doubt if they removed anything at all. So, and the workers, one of the workers, there actually touched the rod. The rod was only. Even though he touched a place when went where it wasn't even covered with a sheet of plastic, so uh, if that was a real life thing, he's, that would he's be a dead. real you know violation of he'd be dead then. Yeah, you yeah. would not touch a rod. No, uh, and then no. also you would have a you normally would have a grappling hook, a stave, or uh -huh. just a wrench uh -huh. or something, a uh, hammer, uh, which you would separate yourself from the of rod. Of course, you would not touch a rod. That's rule yeah. one. Yeah, that's rule one. You don't touch this stuff. You no. would guide it with a stave, a wooden stave, or something. Yeah. So it made no sense at all. And if that's the level of safety, then there is no safety there. I mean, it is, it is a, it's a death zone for these guys. And, uh, and they're not being told, just like we heard from the initial record. They weren't told of uh, the, the real threat that they face, the risk they face. And a lot of these guys, you know, they're uneducated guys. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not like, you know, you know, many of them never graduated from high school. They don't know the difference, you know. They've never gotten any science education. They don't know what they're up against, you know. So, they're not. Uh, they don't know. They're not going to be told. They're they're expendable, yeah. Yochi. They're yeah. just they're just yeah. carbon based expendable yeah. workers. And and meanwhile, this whole cover up's going on. The uh, national uh, the atomic uh, nuclear regulatory commission uh, set up some hearings all in towns where where they have regional headquarters for the economic economy ministry. Uh, all the uh, all the so called public that was there was by invitation only. And they were all vetted. The questions were all vetted. And all the candidates for the new independent nuclear regulatory uh, commission, uh, after the old one was with the Ministry of Economy, they, they're all somehow connected to the government or some you know, corporation, uh, let's say public corporation, that receives money from the government. So it's all strings attached again. The government cannot you know, break with this vice of total control over anything to do with nuclear and any information. So it's a rigged job. I think uh, my former colleagues at Japan Times called the, the hearings a sham. And so that's, you know, and that's pretty much an establishment paper, you got to understand, calls the hearings a sham. It's not, it wasn't really a public hearing. It was just a setup. Again, after all of the criticism from the independent commissions, and, you know, it's, it's been a barrage of criticism, and yet they still go right back to the habitual, you know, closed loop of uh, authority. So. So All right. Well, we're sick. We're, what, what are the people talking about with respect to their food supply? Do they know that most of the food is now 
hopelessly contaminated with radiation? It well, really the is. The fisherman we talked to was a good, good, uh, you know, source. They said if they have boats. There's fish out there, but what's the point of catching them? There's no market. So obviously, a lot of people are voting at their, you know, at the supermarket not to buy the fish. So the, I think a lot of the show that the government has put on about supporting the fishermen and bringing their products to market. Again, that may be a show. It may not be fish from the area. They just may be, you know, have a fake wow. labeling that from the area. Well, we, somewhere else and one thing, no one's buying it. Yeah. yeah, we do know for sure that TEPCO is in no hurry to try to pull those fuel assemblies out because many of them are broken and they don't even know. And if yeah. they start pulling out yeah. uh, two foot long fuel assemblies instead of 12 feet long, it's going to be pretty embarrassing with the video. Right, and which is why uh, there's no way a worker could have been touching a real fuel rod. You know, it would have been hot as hell. You know, it's something that maybe never was really in the hole. You know, that they should have lifted. Yeah, we don't know. We do remember that TEPCO told people, "Please do not videotape until we're ready." <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. So, there you yeah. go. So anyway, anyway, just the reign of lies again. Yeah. You know? Indeed. So, all right, my friend. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Take care of yourself. Uh, next Talk. week, then. I hope you get a line again. Uh, right. then. We, we will. We got through today. We got through. Okay. All right. All right. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Yoshi Shimatsu in Japan. For you, information. And we'll be back tomorrow night. Thanks for being here. Take care. Talk soon.